Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome back to Diction for Dollars at the Bureau of Experimental Speech and Holy Theses. Um, we're here for around two um, from now until around 7.30. People can earn $1 a minute to speak before our live in in-house audience, as well as our online audience who might be watching now or who might be watching the recording of all of this in the future. So um, uh, again, uh, the, the, the way Diction for Dollars here at BESHT works is you can earn up to a dollar. Well, you will earn a dollar a minute for every minute that you speak. Um, we always round down here. So if you speak for five and a half minutes, you will earn $5 and your max is 20 minutes. You can speak up to 20 minutes and then you'll be booted off if you do not stop. And in fact, um, we, have a, we have a red alligator back there which indicates that you are done. We have a yellow alligator which means that you have a couple minutes, you have a minute or two left, so. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, so there we go. Thank you very much. And um, I also encourage people before they, um, uh, before they leave tonight to check out our fabulous Best Weekly. The third issue just came in today. It's hot off the presses. I haven't even had a chance to look at it yet, it's, but it's incredible. I've seen the PDFs. Um, please check it out. It has a bunch of wonderful prompts available for uh, the Radical Retour if, uh, if, you, if you are lacking and ideas for what you might uh, lecture on tonight. There are some great ones in there. Um, also, if you're just planning to observe, there are a bunch of great performances in all three issues that you can do as the activist or active listener. So um, feel free to check those out and perform those while your, your friends and colleagues are lecturing. But without further ado, I, I'd like to invite up our first um, Diction for Dollars uh, uh, speaker for the night, a repeat, a repeat um, uh, addiction for dollars, friend of ours named Erwinda Vesup, and she's going to talk about sexual abuse. Can everybody give a big round of applause for Erwinda? <laughs> everyone. I'll be speaking with you regarding the effects and significance of sexual abuse and the survivor's recovery. The healing process from sexual abuse, uh, external options as well as spiritual. Okay. <clears throat> Did you know that every two minutes someone is raped in the United States? Well, less than 39% of crimes are reported. 80% of survivors reported knew their offenders. And over 50% of those convicted offenders will serve less than one year in jail for their crime. Isn't that something? More than 90% of people with developmental uh, disabilities, they are sexually abused. Okay. And I did this research um, basically to become educated myself and become aware. So I found a, a lot of uh, interesting statistics and a lot of uh, interesting information with regard to every one of us becoming um, educated and informed regarding the topic of sexual abuse and how we can help um, individuals, our friends, you know, how we can help, you know. This is an alarming statistic, so it's important that we are informed so that we can know what resources to give to them, how to respond, how to be um, sensitive to what they have experienced, okay? One in every six women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime, and college-age women are four times more to be sexual, uh, sexually assaulted. It was interesting to find that one in seven men will be assaulted as well. 
And I'll read you those statistics later on. With these projections, it is very imperative and important that we are all aware and become educated of sexual abuse offenders and how they target their victims. Okay, so the crime, um, rape and sexual assault statistics are as follows. Crime cases, 75%. Defendants charged, 34%. Detectives, 64%. CPS prosecuted, 23%. Court proceedings, 21%. Convictions, all offenders, 13%. Convictions, rape, 6%. I believe it has something to do with the shame, the embarrassment, um, that, and the stigma with regard to both men and women. Sexual abuse. The most common perpetrators of rape are husbands and are partners, dating partners, someone you know. Also, alarmingly, I found out, it was not psychotic people, strangers. It was people who knew of the other person. They, they were their friends. Um, they were either relatives in the family, you know, friends of the family. Okay, so 97% of callers to rape hotlines knew their offenders prior to the assault. And according to the 2001 stats, 47,000 in 190,000 assaults were female rapes, victims and attempted rape cases. All right, so I will talk to you about the assault with regard to children. Studies indicate that youth are the most at risk groups for sexual violence in our community with one in four girls and one in six boys experiencing a sexual assault before the age of 18. The crime has reached epidemic proportions. According to the National Center for Victims of Crime, child sexual abuse is any sexual contact with a child or teenager, including but not limited to any sexual contact with children, that is, forcing a child to have sexual contact with another adult or child, showing a child pornographic material, exposing oneself to a child, okay? So sexual abuse of children can happen to boys and girls of any age, of any race, of any background. Despite the popular belief that strangers more commonly hurt children, the truth is that children are most often abused by someone in a position of authority, someone they trust, a family member, a friend, a teacher, a coach, a minister. It is most common that their bruiser is someone that the family knows. Signs of sexual abuse. Signs of sexual abuse in children are not always physical in nature. However, the physical signs can include redness or irritation in a genital area, the urinary tract infections of STD or stomach pains. More common are emotional and behavioral signs such as anger, hostility, irrational and extreme fear, depression, and withdrawal. Signs of a bruise in teens can include those listed above, I've already stated, as well as suicidal idolation, teen pregnancies, depression, running away, and promiscuity. If you find or know of a person that um, you can observe these types of signs and symptoms, you might want to be of help to them, okay? You can call the 24-hour crisis hotline and get them some help. Male rape. I wanted to balance out my research because initially I didn't realize or know that men were being assaulted by men as well and that rape is escalating. I did not know that. I interviewed one of the um, advocates here on campus here and I found I was really informed a whole lot and it's true and it's really sad that in our broken society this social issue of sexual abuse is affecting everyone. So we really need to be more um, aware and concerned and with 
with the motive to help, okay? So male rape, about 3% of American men, one in 33, have experienced a rape or attempted rape. An estimated 92,748 men are raped each year in the United States. Most sexual assaults to men are perpetuated by other males. However, male rape has nothing, it has nothing to do with sexuality of the offender or the victim. It has to do, just like in cases of women, it has to do with the perpetrator's need for dominance, need for control, need to humiliate, need to harm someone, okay? So there has been an underreporting of rape with regard to men because of, they also are ashamed and embarrassed that this has happened to them. Okay, so there is a social stigma that is around the topic of sexual assault, abuse, and rape. And I hope by sharing and talking about this that we could kind of like attempt to erase, if not erase, the stigma because the alarming rates, it is epidemically very high. And by talking about it and sharing, we can do something about it. We can make a difference, okay? If you have been sexually assaulted, get to a safe place immediately. Call the sexual hotline. Report the incident, get medical attention, okay? That's with regard to the men. There are certain myths out there that has actually shaped our communities and shaped our societies, and I wanna share some of those myths so we don't, we're not aloof or we're not ignorant of or knowledgeable about the topic, and we could be more um, concerned. Myth one. Most sexual assaults are committed by strangers. The fact is, approximately 80% of rape survivors know their, assault, their assaulting person, their perpetrators, their offenders, they know them. Myth number two, it can't happen to me. I won't be raped or assaulted. Fact, one in four women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Approximately one in seven men will be victims as well of sexual assault. Myth two, women lie about rape in order to get revenge or because they feel guilty about having sex. Fact, according to FBI investigations, only about 2% of all reported rape charges are found to be false, okay? An individual is more likely to lie about being robbed than to lie about being sexually abused. Myth four, women ask to be raped. Fact, the way people look, the way people act or dress does not invite sexual assault. No individual asks to be raped, nor is any person responsible for the violent criminal behavior of someone else. Sexual assaults are never the fault of the victim. Myth five, rapists are lonely, sexually unfulfilled men, fact. Rapists do not fit a stereotype image. Assailants can be anyone from a family member, a friend, a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend, a coworker, or another acquaintance. Studies of convicted male rapists indicate that over 60% were married and virtually all had normal sexual relationships with women at the time that they committed the assault. Myth six. Boys and men cannot be sexually assaulted. Fact, again, approximately one in seven men will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Unfortunately, men often do not report their sexual assaults because of even, even greater social stigma. If a male is sexually assaulted, it does not mean that he is or will become a homosexual. Often sexual orientation of both the rapist and the victim are not relevant to the assault that occurs. Myth seven, most ra rapes occur in streets or parking garages. Fact, the vast majority 
of rape occur in either the victim or the assailant's home. Myth eight, if people fought or resisted hard enough, sexual assaults would not occur. Fact, most adult victims, even those who are not physically harmed, fear injury and death during an asex a sexual assault. Children who are assaulted, they're often confused. They're an, they are un, unable to power, to question the power because it's a significant person, it's, a, it's an adult, someone that they trust. Okay, so they, the children, they choose not to fight. All right, it's just not the same. So I talk about four types of, of abuse. I'm talking about written statistics, I've given you that already. I did a qualitative survey myself I, I interviewed at random about 20 people. Um, I had them take my survey, and then I did an interview where I talked and heard stories with 10 people, and I heard their stories. I saw and learned a distinct, consistent pattern in the experiences that were shared to me, okay? I also uh, searched out some of the recoveries that are occurring in some of the uh, traditional counseling for therapies that are out there, self-help um, type of uh, activities that survivors engaged in, um, and resources, okay? So this has been a very interesting research for me. So I'm gonna share with you what is molestation, what is rape, and what is assault. Molestation. Molestation is a crime of sexual acts with children up to the age of 18, including touching of private parts, exposure of genitalia, taking of pornographic pictures, rape, inducement of sexual acts with the molester or with other children, and variation of these acts by pedophiles. It also applies to incest by a relative with a minor family member. Any unwanted sexual acts with adult short of rape. What is sexual assault? Sexual assault is defined by the California Education Code, section 94385, as inclusive of rape, forced sodomy, forced oral copulation, rape by a foreign object, sexual battery, or a threat of sexual assault. What is rape? It is a type of sexual assault usually involving sexual intercourse, which is initiated by one or more persons against another person without that person's consent. Rape can be categorized in different ways by reference of the situation in which it occurs and by the identity of the characteristics of the victim. Rape by deception is a crime. It is a crime in which the perpetrator has the victim's sexual consent and compliance, but he gains it through deception and fraudulent statements. Why the victims do not seek help. When a woman suffers um, sexual assault and rape from her husband or a man she trusts and has known for a long time, it is very hard for her to call it rape and call that person a rapist because she feels that no one will believe her. However, police training and practice have improved dramatically over the past years and you can now be expected to be taken seriously when you report the incident. On the graph here, the blue represents um, individuals that were assaulted. The red represents individuals that were molested. And the green, those individuals that were raped. This is in just my qualitative study I did not do a huge like thousands, you know, I wanted to just see, okay, if I just took a number and chose to assess that number, what would I get? Will I see some consistency? Will I see some uh, running patterns? I found them, okay? So, as you can say, ad as you can see, adolescents that were uh, assaulted, I did 20, you see the four. Um, I seven. You see, you see seven that were molested when they were adolescents. As teenagers, you see there was a five. And some of them, um, also I'm gonna pause right here because some of them were not only uh, assaulted as adults or children, but also as adults. 
Okay, that was interesting to me as well. Okay, so then I have uh, four indicating four rape at teen, when they were teenagers, um, 11 as adults, and then I have 10 molested as adults, and then a high, uh, high age 16 for rape as an adult. This is just a small study, okay? Okay, sorry. When I interviewed, um, just engaging with them in conversation, I protected the identity and I um, pointed the camera at myself and I asked them a lot of the same questions that were on the, the survey. And as I stated, um, I was very empathetic as to the stories that I heard. Um, and I was grateful that they um, felt um, open enough and comfortable with me enough to share their stories. Um, as a result of this study too, I learned that there is something that we all can do. Talk about it. If someone shares their story with you, be sensitive. Um, don't be cold hearted because it can happen to anyone, okay? Um, also, you can go and visit um, on PBS. It's called No on, N -O on PBS.org and it gives a, either a 15 minute videotaping of a young lady that was raped and how she handled it and how the legal system helped her bring her offender to court and justice was served. So they tell you, if this happens to anyone you know, immediately have them rush to a hospital. Um, ask, uh, well, don't make them feel uncomfortable. You wanna ask them questions. You wanna make sure that they don't remove their clothing or anything so that they can get the evidence off of them by the smell, by the touch, by anything. All of it is evidence, okay? So make sure you, uh, you know what to do. I do have some handouts as well. Thank you. I do have some handouts as well. When a person is um, raped, assaulted, or bruised, or molested, it is a violation of their soul, okay? Something has been taken away from them that can never be replaced, okay? So, um, it takes a long time to heal. In my research, I found as well, it takes a long time to heal. Some people did not heal. Some people committed suicide. Some people um, are still in phases of their process of recovery. Um, very interesting um, and something I want to continue to research. <laughs> okay. Power of support groups. Make sure you get, um, get in contact with a support group, which is the hotlines which is like Ruth, Project Sisters, there are a lot out there. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you and have a great evening. With, uh, with a total of 20 minutes and just a few seconds, she has earned $20. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, Thank you so much, Erwinda, for that great lecture. Um, we'll keep things going. Um, now, a reminder that for Diction for Dollars, you have up to 20 minutes to speak, and you're earning a, a dollar a minute. 
Um, all of this is being uh, transmitted online and, will, and is being recorded as well, so just be aware of that. And um, so, but up next will be Adam Jedediah with, um, uh, is it Bits? So let's hear it for Adam. All righty. Can I like, can I like, oh, I got this. Yeah, it might be careful. It might. Okay. And things are going to go well. All righty. Hi, everybody. This is, this is exciting. Um, so I got up and talked last time. Dictionary Dollars was here at Pomona. And I kind of got up and figured um, I'd say whatever came to my mind. Um, and I, I did that for about 17 minutes. And I'm not, not quite sure what happened. But I think it was, it was something. Um, this time I thought I would um, try to say something constructive, maybe even somewhat educational, because I, I guess it's not um, very often that people of my age get the opportunity to speak to a group who's actually actively listening to them. Um, it's like almost never. Um, so I guess um, in thinking about this event, a lot of what it is is like a, a sort of practice and appreciation of the everyday and giving people an opportunity to speak who don't usually have that. Um, and it reminded me of this recent trip I took to the Museum of Jurassic Technology, which is really cool. Um, and it's in Los Angeles, and a lot of the different exhibits um, struck me, they were really interesting, but what struck me most was these exhibits in the back, which were just um, like collections of pins and collections of knitted scarves, and they essentially um, were the work that these different women had done over their whole lifetime. Um, they were little collections that people had put together over 80 years. They were probably like totally insignificant in the larger scheme of things. They would have disappeared with that person's death. They were put on as museum um, exhibits like to appreciate the average. Um, so sort of in, in continuation of that, I wanted to pass on just some bits that I've gotten um, at Pomona in the past year. Um, little bits of information that I found interesting. Um, this will be totally disjointed, and you are welcome to interrupt me and tell me so. That's like totally fine. Um, it's probably more interesting it's in, if it's interactive, especially if I'm up here for a while. Um, so in this document to myself, um, I started it off talking about um, Schopenhauer's studies in pessimism. And he had this parable of porcupines. And he was comparing people to porcupines in the cold, um, how they huddle together for warmth, and then they poke each other, and then they shuffle away in pain, um, like separating and congregating, separating and congregating. It's, sort of, it's like a metaphor for interactions, relationships between people. I thought it was really um, kind of comical, but also kind of powerful, really interesting. Um, then uh, I also read a bit of the Jungle Book, um, I'm taking a course in children's literature, like specifically I think it's going to be Christian indoctrination through children's literature next semester. Um, but this was about um, law, and it was the Jungle Book Wolves who gave this lecture on how they needed law so they can be the free people, that they needed structure to step on so they could find freedom, which I thought was a really interesting idea, um, that like total freedom is not anarchy, um, but it's something with a base. Um, then I moved on to linguistics and I learned this little story. Um, where in one of the earliest psycholinguistic experiments, King James IV of Scotland um, abandoned two children in the wild, like as an experiment, because that's what people did when you didn't have to regulate your experiments. Um, great job, science. Um, King James IV abandoned two children and later claimed that they grew up spontaneously learning to speak very good Hebrew, um, which I thought was really awesome. And maybe, maybe it's true. Um, <laughs> but you can't abandon kids in the woods anymore. Um, also interesting linguistically, um, so there's an idea um, by Skinner which is called like radical behaviorism. It's like a really simple idea. It's essentially that everything you learn in language, everything is taught. It's like that little baby over there. Like you're a teacher, everything. Um, and there was this really simple response. Like this was like this totally solid theory. Like you teach your kids everything. Of course you do. They listen to you. They repeat it. And then, um, like this, this guy, Noam Chomsky, um, did this study on Japanese babies, which is so cool. And he was like, at six months, Japanese babies can distinguish between L and R. And by 12 months, they can't. Like, they completely lose the ability to distinguish it. It's, it's not taught. They literally can't hear the difference, which I thought was really um, interesting. Um, some random terms. Um, a Procrustean bed. 
is an arbitrary standard to which exact conformity is forced. Um, you stretch someone or you squish them down to fit what you like. Uh, it comes from Theseus having to overcome Procrustes, who, who stretched his guests to fit his iron bed, which I thought was pretty cool. And in the theme of uh, Greek ideas, I thought the Greek idea of, of, of beauty, like Walden, um, in, Thoreau discusses in Walden, like the Greek idea of beauty, it's really cool. He has, this, he has this quote he talks about, it's a very Greek idea, a very profound one, like beauty is terror, and whatever we call beautiful, we quiver before it. And what could be more terrifying and beautiful to souls like the Greeks or our own than to lose control completely? Um, heads thrown back, throat to the stars, more dear than human being, to be absolutely free. Um, interesting quotes. All right, so um, moving on from interesting quotes down to just strange things that I've learned. Um, Martin Luther, uh, who you guys, you guys might have heard of, I don't know. Um, he hated German three-pin bowling. He just, he just hated it. He just couldn't stand it, and he invented nine-pin bowling, and that was his legacy until the, until the 95 Theses thing. But that way, he was, he was big for the nine-pin bowling. Um, also interesting that, um, uh, that he says that um, no action, only faith, has an impact, impact on the soul. So that's why evangelicals don't dress up for church. It also, um, he wrote this whole, after writing a pamphlet on nine-pin bowling being the best kind of bowling, he wrote on how gay marriage is a matter of the soul and that secular power cannot mediate it, which I thought was interesting. Um, I'm from New York. I also thought it was really interesting that the Church of New York still sells indulgences, can still pay for your sins, um, which is what inspired Luther's 95 Theses and the Protestant Reformation in the beginning, and we just, we just continue to do that, um, which is weird. All right, I already talked about, uh, I talked about anonymity. Uh, I don't know. You can go to the Church of New York. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of Jewish, um, so I don't know. Um, I was just reading about it online a little bit. Whoops. Um, I can't tell you, but in my next talk, I'm going to get to that. You will. Oh, yeah. It's big. Okay. I'll get on that. Um, yeah, 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 you're right. This is good. I like it. Um, uh, I already talked about um, anonymity last week. Not sure if that sunk into anybody who wasn't here, but I'm going to skip it anyways. Um, I thought this was a really interesting um, Freudian claim. We were reading a little bit of Freud, and Freud says that flames are phallic symbols. I'm like Freud says, a lot of things are penises, but you got it. You got to follow this one. Um, so, flames are phallic symbols, um, and men have an infantile desire to quench fire sexually with their urine. So, um, that's a dominant and homosexual act. The first man who controlled his urges and did not urinate owned the fire and then quickly gave it to the woman to take care of it because she is not in competition with it. Which is like kind of fascinating to like come up with that out of the blue. I don't know what happened, um, but it did. That's, that's really interesting. I kind of wrap my head around that. Um, <laughs> oh man. Well, also, um, so I was watching Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a great speaker um, on wimp.com, which is a great website. Um, if any of you guys are in need of some, some time wasted, if this isn't doing the trick, um, you guys should check out Neil deGrasse Tyson. He debunks the 2012 theory like really, really simply. Um, so the idea is that the world will come to an end when the center of the galaxy, the sun, and the earth come uh, in alignment. And Neil deGrasse is like, actually, that literally happens every year on December 21st, not just in 2012, so that's, that's silly. Um, also, another point, um, so they predicted that the world would end in a couple months. Um, they also predicted that the Earth was formed in 3113 BC, which is about four billion years off, so like, seems strange that we would bet on this one, not on that one. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. In the realm of science, not that. So, um, I read this really cool story. Um, <laughs> thank you, I like this. This is good. Um, there's a kind of fluke known as the Dichrocelium dendriticum. Um, it starts inside of a snail. <laughs> it's a funny name. Um, so, this fluke starts inside of a snail, and then it moves into an ant, it moves into a sheep. 
hidden within an ant. Um, some of these resourceful worms migrate to their host's brain where they manage to rewire its neurons, essentially hijacking its body, which is a totally wild idea. Um, this spore literally hijacks a brain, knows which neurons to change, so that the manipulated ant, in response to the dichrocellium's demands, climbs to the top of a blade of grass and waits patiently until it's consumed by a grazing sheep. Once in its desired happy breeding ground, the worm releases its eggs, which depart with a healthy helping of sheep poop, only to be consumed once more by snails, which eventually excrete the immature worms for another generation of unlucky ants to consume. Which is like wild, which is so cool. Um, that happens, like right out there on the lawn. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, also, speaking of things that happen outside on the lawn, was that a no, like you don't believe me or like, uh, it's there, it happens on other lawns that are outside this place. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. That's also true. Um, also happening on the lawn, the urge to perform feats of strength for no good reason seems, <laughs> seems to be deeply embedded in the male psyche. Um, Shaw's manhood stones are just modern versions. So manhood stones are like the big things that the strongest men in the world throw up and down, and then they flex, and then they win nothing except the title of strongest man because no one watches. Um, they're modern versions of thousand pound volcanic boulders unearthed on this Greek island of Santorini. Um, this boulder was um, etched with a boast from 6th century BC and it's like Eumastus, son of Cotobolus, lifted me from the ground. Um, which is pretty funny. The Vikings tossed logs, the Scots threw sheaves of straw, the ancestors of the Inuit um, carried walruses around supposedly. But I don't, I don't think that probably didn't happen. Um, just, I don't know, maybe, maybe they were just awesome. Um, cool quote from Rousseau. Um, the first man who, having enclosed a piece of ground, bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the real founder of civil society. From how many crimes, wars, and murders, from how many horrors and misfortunes might not anyone have saved mankind by pulling up the stakes or filling up the ditch and crying to his fellows, beware. Beware of listening to this imposter. You are undone if you once forget that the fruits of the earth belong to us all and the earth itself to nobody. Which I thought was really cool. Um, yeah, yeah. These are things that I like. Um, sometimes I get angry at modern art, speaking of maybe what I'm doing currently. Um, well, caught myself there. Um, this is a really good response. Um, to critiques of blank canvases. You see at the moment, frame blank canvases, like, of course I could do that myself. Um, so in the response to, of course I could do that myself, like, why should I pay money to look at it? Um, so a lot of what you see when you look at modern art is the results of a revolution that began with the invention of the camera. Um, so art was no longer visual documentation of the world. The camera does that better. Artists now have the freedom to experiment with the conceptual instead of documenting the physical. That's what modern art is. It's, it's experimenting um, in the cultural context and the history built around those experiments. So Steve Jobs built a computer in his garage and now he's famous. Um, who cares if I could cobble together a computer in my garage? Anyone um, would boast that their homebrew computer is equal to Jobs doesn't understand it. So by that logic, Rosa Parks just sat on a bus and even a four-year-old could do that. Wow, oh, four-year-old, you're not four. You're, you're small. Um, so, um, I think I think I've uh, I've read I've read enough of these things. I'm gonna move on. I think um, to a to a so, oh gosh oh gosh oh we're, okay good thank you this is great all right um, thank you this is good thanks I like that um, so this is these are sort of intertwined hopefully or they are not and then I'm lost. Um, so, um, I was reading uh, about um, the DSM. Um, so, the DSM um, is what defines mental illness in our country um, and kind of the world. It's the only pamphlet that psychologists have to reference when they are diagnosing people. It's incredibly important, um, is the point. Uh, if you want to call someone schizophrenic or bipolar, you reference the DSM, you reference symptoms, and that's how you define a disorder. Um, so I'm part of the Pomona Student Union. We had a speaker come, and his name was Dr. Peel. Um, and he's one of 20 doctors overseeing this like incredibly important DSM-5. A new one is coming out. Um, 
this was this was the change in the 80s like the dsm-3 defined homosexuality as a mental disorder and then after that they changed that it sort of changes as society changes um but i guess a big point of this talk was that it changes society i'm going to read you some of the points um if i go too fast you can tell me i thought this was a talk that um like everybody in the world should have heard uh, again i'm not one for conspiracy theories but this like comes from one of the 20 people defining the dsm um Interesting that 70% of the board of the DSM-4 has ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, now, with the DSM-5, doctors can be paid up to $10,000, but research grants are undisclosed, and contracts with the industry can be postponed for the duration of the DSM and then started up again. Um, so, point being, there are ties to the pharmaceutical industry economically. Um, so, the, um, the, the, the fact is, um, that pharmaceutical companies obviously have an interest, a vested interest, in defining things as disorders, not differences. Um, so, pharmaceutical companies need to sell drugs and can only do that after they convince people they're ill. Um, like GlaxoSmithKline went to Japan, spent millions convincing people they were depressed, and then sold them antidepressants which is like really, really interesting. Um, clinicians can only provide care if patients are deemed ill, otherwise insurance companies won't cover the cost. Um, insurance, clinicians, pharmaceutical industry so far have vested interests. Also, parental groups fight change in the DSM that narrows definitions of mental illness um, to difference so that their children can get drugs covered by insurance. Um, so, parents, insurance agencies, clinicians, and pharmaceutical industry all have an urge to call different a uh, disorder. Um, also, um, NAMI, the National Advocates for Mental Illness, these are the people who greet mothers and patients when they walk out of mental wards. Um, they give classes in mental disorders, how it's not the patient's fault, it's a biological disorder. Um, NAMI is funded by pharmaceutical companies, which seems like our country wouldn't let that happen, but they do. Um, also, the strangest thing, um, I guess the most important thing uh, that, I, that I wanted to pass on um, was that 54% of the DSM um, is not rooted in biology or science, and they're open about that. So 54% of uh, the DSM has no reference to tangible causal agents. They're just supposed to be vocabulary. So when they define a mental illness, it's supposed to be vocabulary, so you can reference symptoms and understand the symptoms. It's not supposed to be a definition of a disorder. Um, which I thought was really interesting. I, I, I did not know that. Um, I, think I've, I think I've been talking for a while, um, so I, I kind of want to... How, how much time do I have? I just got to pick some time. Wow, this is going, this, this is going fast. Oh, I could, I could do twice. I could try my best. Are you guys good for like another three minutes? Okay, oh my gosh. Oh my, I don't know if the clap is supposed to end things or continue, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it as continuing, damn it. Um... Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so, I'm just going to read you random stuff then that I wrote down. Um, so, the Luddites um, destroyed looms because they did not approve of new technology, um, and people now classify themselves as neo-Luddites, who are like anti-Facebook. I thought that was cool. Um, then, Camus quote, oh, I read you something earlier on beauty. <laughs> Um, beauty is unbearable, drives us to despair, offering us for a minute the glimpse of an eternity that we should like to stretch out over the whole of time. Um, some other cool stuff. Um, in Twi Demela is how you say he who greets with fire um, in Setswana, and that's the coolest name for a lion ever. Um, there's like this awesome National Geographic special on a lion named he who greets with fire. And that was pretty sweet. Um, Pretty cool. Um, Diogenes, the cy Diogenes the dog. Um, Diogenes the cynic. This is a cool one here. I'll end on this. So there's this guy named Diogenes the dog. Um, he birthed cynicism. Um, he sat in public, naked in a bathtub. Um, he was famous for a couple things. He, he masturbated in public, and, he, and when people would be like, please stop, he would say, like, if only I could soothe my hunger by rubbing my belly, which I think is totally fair. Um, not that... I won't do that. Um, also, really cool, um, Alexander the Great heard of what a great philosopher he was. That's a double use of great. I should avoid that. Um, Alexander the Great came and talked to him, like this great conqueror, and he stood over him, and he's like, what can I give you, Diogenes? I will give you anything. And he's like, give me back my son. You're blocking my shadow, which is pretty cool. And then um, Plato famously defined man as a featherless biped. Uh, featherless biped. 
Um, after defining man as a featherless biped, um, Diogenes walked up to him, plucked a chicken, and threw it at him. And he's like, I give you man, which is awesome. Um, and so then Plato had to redefine him, saying a featherless biped with broad, flat nails. Bl a featherless biped with broad, flat nails. Um, oh, gosh. Been talking for a while. Hope this was good. This was good for me. I like talking. Um, thanks for listening, guys. That's about it. so much. Thank you so much, Adam. <laughs> Up next, um, we'll be having a David uh, Con uh, Logan Connor. Um, just a reminder, everything here is being broadcast online and recorded as well. And you have up to 20 minutes to speak at a dollar a minute, a rate of dollar a minute. Um, uh, so is David here? Yes. So everybody welcome David. He'll be doing some poems. So before I do the poems, I just want to talk about something because I put 15 minutes down on that thing. And I don't know if uh, poems will last that long. But uh, so we have this thing at our school called dining halls. And in them, there's like prepared food and you put it on your plate and you eat it. And there's also these things called expositions where they have people preparing our food in front of us and we wait in line as they prepare it. And I was just thinking recently about how weird I feel when I'm on one of those lines and how it's such a strange dynamic. And it's because it's this person's doing you like a very nice thing, which is like making your, your food. So like you're very grateful and like you feel like indebted, but at the same time, you're also like really hungry. And you're like, you're looking at them making the food and you're just like, make the shit out of that thing right now. Like I'm so hungry. But like you have to like control both sides of your brain while this is happening. And so it's very strange. Um, so now I'm going to read some poems. Um, <laughs> extend that. And um, no, you guys can extend that in your own heads. Um, some poems, and my grandmother calls them poems, like P-O-M-E, which I, and she's from Brooklyn, New York, and she's like, yeah, read that poem, which, which I think is like the proper way to pronounce poem, because I feel like poems have like a certain air of like pretension and like, oh, he's going to read a poem. But when, if it's like, when it's a poem, it's like, that's what I'm about to read to you. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> po poetry is stupidity? Well, to attempt to say okay. something is beautiful in a, in a culture that isn't interested and probably can't produce anything beautiful is stupid. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I like that a lot. Beautiful. All right. I'm going to read some, some stupid poems. <laughs> this one is called 1996. <laughs> Corduroys and payphones on wintry New York City nights. They say tomorrow that it will snow. Red blankets curl around toes and hands in unfurnished bedrooms. 
moon and window and festive lights of old curly-haired Christian ladies as a mouse finds its way downtown. The head of a jack-o'-lantern tries to find some sleep under the stars that are not there. This one's called Ferris Wheel. Maroon fuzzy cushion sheet like moldy old people. A TV and the boy wanting very most to be the TV he watches, or at least to be something to watch. Down to the ocean for salt and carousel wind patterns, and a Ferris wheel flight into high atmosphere, above Coney Island for a vision of the parking lot and further. Eyes shielded by unassuming brown hair as the Ferris wheel descends to the boardwalk. Nighttime. Laughter and smiling lipstick glasses. Silver plated forks where salads once were. French door, marble floor, as umbrellas catch a cab. The moon and the clock are both one. Have I had too much to drink? Let the beat drop and let my feet think. The stairs to your room are dark and wooden, like the scaffolding on Spring Street. There, the raindrops fall sideways onto blurred vision, and the taxis kick up ghost trails behind them on sodden red and green streets. Somewhere, someone takes a long walk to the sixth train. Quickly to sleep, quietly and with slippers. Tomorrow, the city will buzz again in the daylight, and I will realize that the rain has ruined my shoes and that you were never here. You got two more. The fruit stand on 4 a.m. Crazy ladies stand in front of fruit stands. A lady, the mangoes and apples entice her. A man stands near the fruit stand. He has a mustache. Indeed, so do the mangoes. The lady hands the man a postcard. It says that things are fine. The man writes back and agrees that things are fine. This continues for some time as the apples and mangoes fester in the heat. And this last one, is, this is a work in progress, as they all are, but this one in particular. It's called Grandpa Marcel. Umbrellas and windows, a tuna fish sandwich. Inside, a diner, and my grandfather across from me. The fish tank is dark and the lighting is poor. Water rings on tables from clear cups. For a moment, your gray hair is appealing, and so is the smell of tuna fish. Over there, the ketchup is upside down. I fold the napkins and let you do the talking. So those are the poems that I've written. And thank you. Um, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this with a real poem by Wallace Stevens called The Snowman. That's, I think, is a great, great poem. And maybe I get some more dollars if I read it real slow. <laughs> One must have a mind of winter to regard the frost and the bows of the pine trees crusted with snow, and have been cold a long time to behold the junipers shagged with ice, the spruces rough in the distant glitter of the January sun, and not to think of any misery in the sound of the wind, in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land, full of the same wind that is blowing in the same bare place. For the listener, who listens in the snow, and nothing himself, beholds nothing that is not there, and the nothing that is. All right, thank you.
a hand here. Six dollars for David, Logan, and Connor. One, two, two three, four, five, six. Thank you, everyone. This is fabulous so far. Thanks, everybody, for the wonderful uh, talks. Um, a couple uh, quick reminders. This is the Bureau of Experimental Speech and Holy Theses. Um, our definition of what a talk or a lecture is is, fa is fairly expansive, so feel free to experiment um, now or at some of our upcoming Diction for Dollars. Uh, we'll have another one happen, um, I believe it's uh, November 29th, a Thursday after Thanksgiving. Um, and then another one the Thursday after that. So, uh, but you know, feel free to speak as fast or as slow or as inaudibly as you want, um, or just grunt for a little bit. We don't care. So, um, uh, oh, and also plan to stick around tonight if you can. At eight o'clock, we're uh, we're going to be having a, a wonderful artist and friend named Anna Mayer will be here, and she'll be presenting um, her negative sessions, um, uh, which is pretty fantastic. And so she'll be doing that from um, 8 until around probably 9.30ish. And then we'll continue after a short pause with more Diction for Dollars until a little bit before 11. So make sure you stick around and send your friends. Also, just so you know, all of these, um, uh, we're posting all of these videos on YouTube and on our Facebook page at Best X. So if you look at, for us on Facebook, you can find photos, videos, et cetera, on Best X on Facebook. All right. So... Without further ado, let's continue with uh, Caribbean, who is going to present Emotional Geography number 17. Let's hear it for Caribbean. So I have one piece one little piece that I will be reading today. Uh, it's Emotional Geography number 17. I wrote it, uh, well, the, the second title to this poem is uh, Indian Hill Laundromat. So if you're familiar with Indian Hill, that is the Indian Hill that I'm writing about. Um, and let me just get the, the little piece out so I can Oh, but then you get to see it on the thing. I don't want you to see it. Um, here it goes. Anyway, um, I'm interested in emotional geographies, and what that means to me is uh, how space shapes your emotions, how space shapes culture, how the place that you inhabit and uh, move through shapes you and how you shape the space uh, and the relationship that happens there between uh, people and place. And um, so I always write about place and stuff like that. Um, and I, I wrote this piece, I, I've been writing a, a series of these pieces, but um, I wrote this one because uh, my family and I just moved to Claremont uh, some months ago and we live right on the border, I, th I think it's the border, it feels like the border between uh, Claremont and San Jose. So we're like literally a few feet away from Pomona, but we're still technically Claremont. So it's kind of like, like you have some of the niceness, like a little bit of the, the affluence of Claremont still faded into that part of San Jose where I live, but then some of the ghetto-ness of Pomona uh, kind of pushing through there also, so we, I get to see an experience living in, in this kind of blurred uh, region. Uh, it, it, feel, it does feel like a border place, and um, my family and my daughter and I walk up Indian Hill on a regular basis. We're pretty much like the only pedestrians we ever see. We just, it's just me and, I, and the baby walking with the stroller up the street, and we don't see any other living soul. Uh, so I think that's really interesting, and I wonder about like Claremont, like where are all the people walking? And of course, everybody's walking in the village. So when we get to village, and then I get to see like bodies moving around and shopping mostly. Um, 
And uh, you go down to Pomona, also an Indian hill, and then it's an entirely different dynamic, which is really interesting to see. Uh, it's a different class, different socioeconomic, everything going on over there. A lot of Latino, a lot of black from uh, my observation. And my husband's from Pomona, so I'm really interested in Pomona and what happens over there. And um, so uh, th this is, uh, like I said, uh, Indian Hill laundromat. And uh, I never really had to wash at a laundromat because I always was living in a place where you could just wash in your place, in your house, in your apartment, because you have a, la uh, a, a washer there, a dryer. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'm uh, trying to wash at a laundromat. and. There's all kinds, of, I mean, if you're looking for writing material and you're writing, go to the laundromat, seriously, and like hang out there and you will see all kinds of crazy shit. And um, in a really crazy, like astounding sort of way, and, I mean, and then you see like all kinds of, I mean, just the whole spectrum of like human emotion at the laundromat. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and anyway, this is the piece that I wrote. Uh, my face, I know, resembles the face of those who spend too much time outdoors, hustling or wandering the streets. I see their dark, weathered faces turned up and down Indian Hill and running away from and back to Pomona, flaccid neck, skin jerking and quivering the gusts of traffic wind, eyes that find their own shade heavy-lidded. I recognize those faces. That has been me, too. Large avenues busy with invisible hustle and too many cars are often emotional terrain. This is Indian Hill. Dumps you right onto Holt with the rest of them to buy your glittered blue jeans. Lose the glitter and the blue too fast at the Indian Hill laundromat. Push the quarters into the machine you'd rather use for something else. Long have since let go of intention Quarters are so valuable, more so than bills, it seems. You need them for laundry, you need them for the bus, you need them for the meter. If you happen to ride in a car, you are always the first one to ask, the first one asked for loose coins, as if loose coins means easy to let go of. It never gets easy to let go of quarters. It just becomes an uneasy routine. I have dreams in which I have unlimited quarters. If I were rich, I'd want all my money in quarters. If I could give money away, it would be in bushels of quarters. Just think of how much easier life would be all in quarters. Exact change forever. Four quarters makes a dollar the round symmetry of infinity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Go through the ritual. Okay, here we go. We'll hear it again. A Caribbean. Uh, now, just a reminder, if anybody wants to get on the list for this first section of Diction for Dollars, please just come find me with the clipboard, and uh, we'll get you all signed up. Um, 
We have about an hour left of this round of Diction for Dollars, and then we'll have another one after Anna Mayer's session. Um, up, uh, up next to broadcast live online and to be recorded for Diction for Dollars is the fourth. Can we hear it for the fourth? <laughs> Who will read In Pursuing? Hello. Um, I started going as the fourth when I was in um, elementary school and I would sign papers Wes Haas the fourth um, because I thought if I was just Wes Haas the second they might as well call me Wes Haas Jr. and that's stupid. And if I was Wes Haas the third that's just too many vertical lines and that doesn't make any sense either. But if I was Wes Haas the fifth that would just be goddamn unbelievable. So I thought the fourth is a good it's a good little Roman numeral to put after my name. You got your one, you got your, you got your lines, you got your Vs. It's all good. So that's why I'm the fourth. Um, anyways, going back to elementary school some more, that's the last time I made any money to do poetry. So I thought that was awesome that people have been getting up here making money doing poetry. That's fantastic. Um, and <laughs> that is true. That's very true. I've done too much poetry for free, but now that I realize that this is here. Like, who knows what's going to happen. Um, back to no, for reals, I'm just here to make money. I'll be honest. Uh, I went to Vegas last week and lost a lot. Um, I went to Canvas for Obama. Uh, he was in an election. I don't know if everybody knew about that, but yeah, he did that. And um, drove to Vegas from here around 5 in the morning. Got to Vegas, immediately started working, just canvassing for people. Um, we got to the headquarters and they're like, here's some papers, here's some addresses of registered Democrats and independents, like go out, knock on their doors, make sure they know where to vote, how to vote, if they're registered or not, like make sure they have a plan to vote. Because the psychology behind it's cool. Like if you make an actual plan to vote, that's the one thing that like guarantees higher voter turnout. Um, it's not whether or not you get enough people to register, but it's if you actually make them solidify the idea inside their head. So that's what I was doing all Tuesday. And we went out our first round. It was pretty hot in the morning in Vegas, like suburban Vegas, which is a very strange place. You get all sorts of people from, well, most of them tend to be a bit more interesting from like the random parts of the country that they're from. So they're not like accurate representations of what all South Dakotans are like, but they're like the crazy South Dakotans is what I'm trying to say. Um, but they're very good people and they work hard and they really, make enough just to get by and they, they seem to be content with that. So it's an interesting demographic for politicians to get at. And it's, a, it's generally a Republican area, but we were trying to make it Democratic. That was the goal because this year in this election, it happened to be more of a toss up. So Democrats immediately started putting a lot of resources into Nevada. And that's not because that, I don't mean to say they were putting in a lot of money. It was all about the people. What won the election this year was the volunteers and the people who donated their time to like organize and structure this massive movement which no one had ever seen before. And it's the fact that, you know, like people were just doing the basics of actually voting. There were people who were encouraging their friends to vote, going online, finding areas that you could canvass in right near your house. Um, it was incredible what the Obama campaign was able to put together. But anyways, went out in the morning, it's pretty hot. We get back after lunch, we'd had a pretty decent round. I knocked on maybe like 50 doors on our first round, only talked to about 15 people, but I got 13 of them to like make committed plans to go vote. And I actually met this one dude on the street, taught him what a provisional ballot was. He had no idea that he could cast a provisional ballot. He thought he had disenfranchised himself by coming to Las Vegas for the weekend, or for the week to babysit his nieces and nephews. So he was disappointed about that, but I said, no, you can get a provisional ballot. You go in there, this is what you tell them, this is what you gotta do. You're a registered voter, like, this can happen. Um, so he was really, really excited about that. Got his, his nieces and nephews in the car and they drove to the high school around the corner. Um, and that's a guy that like, wouldn't have vote, voted if I hadn't talked to him. So it was interesting to see that an individual such as myself, like this is my first election and I can still have some sort of impact. It's really meaningful. Um, we went back out after lunch and we decided to double our workload because we didn't want to have to keep coming back to headquarters. So we took two times as many clipboards and two times as many addresses, two times as many neighborhoods to cover. And um, we started getting through it. But this was like towards the end of the day, people are actually coming home from work. So we're talking to a lot more people because they're actually opening their doors. Um, 
people are tired of hearing about the election because they're in Nevada and that's all that they've been hearing about for the last like three months. Um, so we got a lot of hostile people and it was really hard at times like you knock on someone's door and this is a stranger but you're talking to them and you just know that they don't like you and you haven't met them, you haven't given them a chance or a reason to understand you as a person but because of the, I the ideals that you're representing, um, they disagree and they just don't like you. So that was, that was interesting. Not to say like I've been liked my whole life, like I've had my fair share of negative encounters with people, but it was just strange to see it in that context with complete strangers. Um, so that's some interesting social psych about that. But anyways, we got some work done. We went to the official Democratic Party party in Mandalay Bay, and um, we were there when the results were rolling in, and I was feeling really good. But I did a stupid thing where I bet a lot of money on Mitt Romney to win the election because this was my rationale. I really, really like gambling, but I, I don't know. I, I really wanted Mitt Romney to lose, and I didn't want to disappoint myself if Obama lost. So I thought if Obama loses and I win 60 bucks, I'll be really happy. Or if Obama wins and I lose 60 bucks, like, that'll be okay too. So it was like, it was a trade off. I hope I explained that okay. But that's why I'm here, coming full circle. That's why I'm here, to make money. Um, <laughs> speaking of money, uh, I thought it was cool how Adam was getting up here talking about some conspiracy theories. And uh, I've got a few that I've been discovering for the past few years. But uh, last year, I took this uh, anthropology class with Lynn Thomas. He's a professor here. Great guy. Uh, he really knows his stuff. He really cares about his students. And this class was all about power, politics, and culture, and who really has the power in all these societies. We were studying like chimpanzees, and then we were studying you know, ancient nations, and then current societies. Um, and I did this final project on ALEC, which is an acronym for the American Legislative Exchange Committee, uh, Exchange Council, excuse me. And ALEC is an institution that has been around since the 70s, but it was created to bring uh, heads of corporations and uh, state legislators together to craft state legislation that would allow these corporations to make a lot of money. Now it's not private stuff, like you can find out this information at any time, but they do a good job of making it difficult to find because what they're doing is legal, but it sounds terrible and if people knew what was happening they'd be outraged. Um, so a lot of you might remember Trayvon, the Trayvon Martin shooting, um, I think that was this, earlier this year or last year, but recently. Um, and the, in that debate, there was this law that was brought up in Florida called the Stand Your Ground Law. And the Stand Your Ground Law um, implies that you know, if you're on your property and if you feel like your, your space is being invaded uh, or if you have like, just cause as the owner of that property, essentially, to stand your ground and use deadly force in the form of a gun. Um, there are a lot of states that have laws like that. I think it's over 30, around 34 states. California is one of them, which I didn't know, and that's strange because I've lived here my whole life. Um, but the stand your ground law, when you have laws like that, it encourages people to purchase handguns because if the law allows it, why not go ahead and buy yourself a handgun and guarantee that extra safety? Safety. Now, I think it's just common knowledge that people tend to do uh, but they have done some dumb things with handguns. So when you put handguns in the hands of people who maybe don't need guns, uh, bad things happen. Now, a bad thing happened to Trayvon Martin. He got shot for no reason. It, I mean, the jury's still out, I think. I don't even know what the final verdict was. But from everything that I heard from police reports, from uh, listening to calls, from listening to analysts about this entire case, uh, he didn't need to be shot and he didn't need to die but he was shot and he died because Zimmerman bought a gun. And Zimmerman bought a gun because it was legal for him to do so. It was legal for him to do so because Walmart sat down with Florida leg state legislators and drafted the Stand Your Grand Ground Law as they drafted every other law in every other state that has such laws. Now, why would Walmart do that? Simple answer, they're the number one distributor of firearms in America. They sell more firearms than any other corporation. So they financially benefit from such laws while other people are dying at their hands. Um, Alec has recently been exposed, I think in 2010, there was this one journalist who began 
publishing these records and trying to get the story out there. He's now the leading expert on ALEC. There's this great website, alecexposed.org. You should go to it. It's factual. It's not just a conspiracy theory. It's what's really happening in the country. Um, but anyways, when I was thinking about talking about this, I was a bit inspired because I had this cup in my jacket pocket. And I'm sorry, Frank Dining Hall. I will give it back someday. Um, but sometimes when I speak into a cup, I sound like one of my favorite movie characters. And one of my favorite movie characters likes to talk a lot about corrupt government. So I thought I'd say a little something about Alec as a... Uh, well, as Bane, see. You trust your government to protect you, to rule the corporation's evil, to protect you from violence, security in your homes. You trust them with your lives. And this is how they treat you. They take your laws. They manipulate them. They give them firearms. And then they turn on you and attack. How much longer will you stand beneath them, inferior to your superiors who wish nothing but your ultimate destruction for the benefit of their wallets? I give you the United States, Mr. Wayne. So anyways, now that I've done that, I want to read some poetry real quick. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm really feeling this beautiful. I've got some poetry. Um, occasionally, I like to scroll through the notes on my phone. I used to have just a classic flip phone until about a month ago. And then I got this, and it's somewhat disturbing how much it's affected me and my habits. But oftentimes, I find myself just pulling out my phone at any situation and writing down a note, which I couldn't really do on my old phone because the keypad didn't really work, and it would always die and lose things that I tried to remember. So anyways. This is a poem that I wrote after a bonfire I had with some friends. Um, we went to the Greek theater. They're all here today. Thanks for being here. Um, but we were having a grand old time. We were singing, and we were enjoying life and each other's company. And then we heard these bagpipes off in the distance, or at least I did. And I couldn't convince anyone that they were hearing the bagpipes too. So um, certain things happened, and I went off in exploration, and then next morning I woke up and I realized I had written this poem around four in the morning after all that experience. It goes like this. I heard the bagpipes calling your name as we reveled by firelight, blissfully denying the mortality of the moon. We stay young forever. I had premonitions of strange events with raucous music and harmonious brethrenation for which we saw no meaning except meaning itself. These premonitions manifested themselves into renditions of my subconscious, reminding me and taunting my memory. I ran off into the woods in pursuit of the ephemeral Pied Piper, a muse led by melodious nostalgia. Over fences and through mental boundaries that mean nothing to me now, I leapt until my hallucination appeared before me, a man dressed in time, ignoring my presence and proving my ultimate insignificance. How the others found me, I know not. Their journeys belong to them and them alone, as mine only belong to me. But though our spheres are differently sized and spaced, our overlaps prove our reality. This is what I have seen. And that's a poem that I woke up to the next day, and I thought that was somewhat interesting. But the weird thing about that is, uh, after reading some of the other poems I've written, I've started to realize certain themes in my subconscious. I like to get to the point where I'm just writing without thinking. It's like, when you speak another language, the way you become fluent in that other language is you stop translating in your head, and you just associate words and concepts in another language. And for me, I've never been able to do that with other spoken languages, but with written language, I feel like sometimes I get my subconscious open to the point where my hand is speaking another language through writing, and it's no longer translating my thoughts, but it's simply independently associating written word with concepts and abstract ideas. So I know that might sound strange, but I hopefully can demonstrate that with this other poem. Um, there was, I've had issues with girls my whole life, as a lot of people do. It doesn't have to be romantic. It's just like if you know a girl, someone who identifies as a girl or multiple of them, you might have had a problem. So I think it's something that, I don't know, everyone can kind of understand. But there's this one girl in particular. I went to high school with her. Um, and she can remain somewhat anonymous unless she ever sees this. But I've already told her all of this anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But we always kind of had a thing at a time, at on and off times for each other. But it was never convenient enough to the overlap where neither one of us was really available for 
any sort of relationship beyond acquaintances. Um, but then we went off to college, and we both ended up in Southern California. And um, I've seen her a few times since we left high school, which is not true for most of my other friends that I haven't seen since we left high school. So it's interesting that she stayed in my life out of all of them. Um, but yeah, I, I went to see her recently, and another friend, I had a few other friends who go to the same school, and we had another talk about everything where nothing was accomplished. And I got up the next morning to get on the train, and I was taking the train. I had to get to Union Station, then catch the train out to Claremont. And um, I saw I had like a 45-minute layover. And then I saw there was another train leaving like four hours later. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to take some time, go into the city, and see what happens. And it could not have been a more perfect day. Like, I was in the weirdest mood where I just wanted to have like a positive experience because I was so confused about this whole emotional mess that I was completely over-dramatizing in my head dramatizing, what have you. Anywho, I go into the city and it's Ciclovia, and that's when they shut down some of the streets and people just bike through the city. Like the streets are completely shut down except for bicycles. And there are just thousands and thousands of people who have spent the entire day just biking around in this place that's always so full of cars. And everyone's so happy. There are families, there are like groups of friends, there are like people who take this really seriously and they've got like all decked out and stuff. And then you've got people who just like, got a bike from like Target an hour ago because they wanted to go out and join in the fun. Then there were like live concerts going on, all the food trucks were there, it smelled delicious. There was a flash mob on the steps of City Hall and it just could not have been a more perfect decision to like, go into LA and try to experience something like bigger than myself and I saw this whole community. Um, and it kind of helped me get a different perspective on my current issues. So I wrote this poem about it, but tying it back to the other one, there are certain symbols that I see linking all of my poetry together. This one was written on a, a curb, just watching bicyclists ride by, not really thinking, just writing down what I saw, so somewhat subconscious. It's called Bicycle Day. Larry is a vision in white from the 80s. He rides solo, probably has it all his life. He fades into the crowd and I start to see the others. I see twins on the handlebars of their fathers, sisters racing their older brothers, beneath beach cruising bros and punk rock feminism, hip kids with snapbacks and fixies. Three generations ride side by side by side, leaving behind memories and legacies without a carbon footprint. Anarchy at its best, we're not going to take it anymore, shouts the rebel yuppie, and everyone smiles. You locks tucks into belts, buckle your helmet. Jenny, she never felt so free as the day she biked through her city, her city. She owned it the second her two rubber wings hit the pavement and she began to fly. She never before dreamed of reaching the sky, but today she became an angel. The cholos and their lowriders pull up next to business white collars wearing skin tight under armor, camel backs and GoPros atop beautifully carved carbon fiber. Today was Joey's first day without training wheels. His debut performance was not without rough patches and band-aids, but it went off without a hitch cart behind his father's mountain bike. One day, he's going to bike mountains too. I was in need of a beautiful day. I came into this city trying to find hope. The temple was first to spring before me, opening its doors and singing its hymns. There are angels everywhere waiting to unfurl their wings and soar higher and higher until skyscrapers look like sketches of circuit boards from a bird's eye view. There is love in this circus. Our rings are intertwined like chains, gears, and tire spokes. Even though we don't speak to each other that often, we still call the same place home. Thank you. Um, How's time going? Just about a little less than two minutes. A little less than two minutes. Okay. Um, this is a quick poem I wrote about working at the Coop Fountain, which I did last year. <sighs> I'm trying to remember how it goes. I wear my Superman cape backwards like an apron, and when I put it on, Lois Lane becomes a microwave and Lex Luthor becomes tables and booths that need to be wiped down again. I don't work at the Daily Planet, I work with my supervisor Janet, and sometimes it seems to me that my kryptonite is the night shift when they stumble in like zombies demanding quesadillas with cream cheese and deep fried poppy seed muffins. What the fuck? And seldom a thank you or a please comes over the counter along with their dead presidents. 
but I don't require their gratuity to recognize the greatness of my creation. You want a milkshake? Nope, here's a dairy-inspired earthquake. Here's some tiger's blood mixed with baked Alaska. You couldn't ask for anything more acid trip inducing unless you ordered a cheeseburger. Did I say a cheeseburger? I'm in a slice of Wonderland topped with some melted Frank Zappa, roasted unicorn dandruff, all put between two toasted dream clouds that also part-time as Zeus's slippers. You said you want some fries, but I think you meant you want a side of Rumpelstiltskin's hand-woven gold seasoned with baby giggles and Don Draper's voice. I don't make fast food. I make once in a lifetime creations wrapped in wax paper. And when I'm mopping, when I'm mopping floors, I'm practicing my runway walk for Michael Kors. This ain't a broom. It's Kate Winslet swooning into my arms as we sail around the kitchen on the Titanic only to crash into the iceberg ice cube machine. This ain't my dream job by any means, but it's still my dream because how we perceive is all up here. It's up to me. So thank you for asking how I'm doing. Now what can I get you today? And with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. Make sure that I'm actually going to hit that limit of 20 minutes. <laughs> Don't want to pull an Adam Horowitz. Keep talking. And there we go. Thank you. Super. This is going great, guys. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful experimental lectures tonight. Um, we're going to continue. We uh, uh, at about we have about 30 minutes until we're going to pause. So we're going until 7:30, and then we'll pause. And then at 8 p.m. tonight, um, uh, we'll be joined by Anna Mayer, who will be presenting Word the Word Negative Sessions, um, which will be pretty fantastic. Uh, please make sure you stick around for that. Um, she's a wonderful artist. Uh, who uh, from Los Angeles and will will she have her book here tonight yeah. yeah and she might she has a new book which has not been officially released anywhere it will be officially or unofficially soft release it'll be a soft release here tonight very exciting there may be a couple copies available for sale um, and then we will continue with uh, uh, diction for dollars after hers uh, her session is complete around probably 930 945 so now, for those of you who may have come in late, um, this is Diction for Dollars, where you can earn up to a dollar, well, you can earn a dollar a minute, uh, up to 20, uh, and you can speak for up to 20 minutes um, in any way you'd like. It can be an experimental uh, uh, form of speech, if you'd like. Um, and you can say anything that you'd like here at the Bureau of Experimental Speech and Holy Thesis. So up next is William Carpenter, the first, who will be doing Will Yum Yummy Yummy Kit Kat. So. Okay. Shopping centers. Shopping centers. Once you've seen one, you, you've seen them all. 
Thank you. <laughs> who is tired, who is really tired of these college kids trying to talk for the whole 20 minutes? Can we get it? Yeah, yep. Yeah. Good, me too. You did okay last time, though. I, I did? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think I'm going to do better this time. I have a topic, so. <laughs> improving. Uh, I wanted to talk about middle school. The topic is middle school, guys. Uh, did everybody go to middle school or junior high? Yeah? Did anybody not? Because I think, okay, we all did that. Okay, I want, I want us all to travel back in time to middle school or junior high or whatever that was for you. Uh, college kids, we talk about it every once in a while. I don't know about the other folk here, uh, but it comes up every once in a while, and normally the cool thing to do is you just say, oh, middle school was awful. You just, you just talk about it, how bad it was, and, that, and everybody says, yeah, I agree, and uh, that's how you say, that's how the conversation goes. Um, but I think middle school is all right for me. Uh, it was, you know, it's a tumultuous time in, in your life, but it's very formative, and uh, I had some good teachers and some good times. Uh, what I'm going to do, the main, the main act is I am going to recite to you all, um, I was thinking about all the, all the art that I've made or all the, all the writings, and this is, this is the one thing that's had the largest impact on, uh, on the public that I've ever produced, and it is my eighth grade graduation speech. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, but I'm not going to read it quite yet. Um, but when I do read it, you can replace the names with people that are in your life, and um, I don't know if it'll come across at all. Uh, they had a contest where it was open to anyone, and uh, they just picked like the three students that they wanted to give speeches. So I wrote mine. I wrote mine, and then I wrote the one that I thought would get in. And then I kind of switched it around a little bit before the day of and uh, made it a little bit edgier, uh, put in some jokes that maybe the adult population was kind of, whoa, they didn't like this. <laughs> but, uh, but no, everybody liked it. And I, yeah, it was, it was a great moment. It really was just having so many people applauding. And it's cool being doing things in public that people like. Um, I'll just tell one random middle school story just to get you in the mood. Uh, this is, I think this is probably maybe a typical middle school story, I don't know. Um, so in seventh grade, I became pretty good friends, just like fairly good friends, but just the kind of friends that hang out at school um, with this girl named Erin Bronstein. And uh, you know, we would just talk in the hallways and we had, we had the same social studies class, so it was pretty cute, we sat next to each other. And I decided I liked her a lot. Uh, it wasn't much of a decision. It was more just like my heart, just like, poof. I don't know how it works in middle school. It just, emotions happen, and you can't control them. I like that part of adulthood more. You can control your emotions. Uh, so I was walking down the hall after school, and I had, I had, I had planned this for a while, and I saw Aaron Bronstein, and I thought, this is it, this is the moment. I'd been talking myself up all day, and I asked her out, and she said, I'll think about it, and uh, she never gave me a response. So that's the story. That's, that's how middle school, <laughs> that's how middle school goes. It's, it's got its ups and downs. That was a sad story, but uh, it had lots of good times, too, good teachers and things. Um, so so here's, here's my speech. Uh, we are in the big wooden gym where eighth grade graduation was, or you can imagine your own place, and all the parents are there, and you feel kind of silly because, you know, it's like it's just eighth grade, but also it's like really cool because your parents are there, and uh, yeah, it's exciting. And you're, you're like, sh I, w I was just shaking and sweating the whole time because uh, I was about to give a speech to a lot of people, but uh, here we go. And I haven't, I don't remember what this says. I haven't read this in years, so pretty crazy. I'll never forget my first day of middle school. With my jeans inches too short and my glasses slightly bent, I was kind of a dork. 
And I was a scared dork, too. Of course, having been at school for three years now, I know there isn't much to be afraid of, but at the same time, I couldn't help it. So I set off to find my first class, and I told myself if I could just make it through the first day, everything would be fine. Things were actually going well. I was fairly sure I was in the right hallway, and I walked into my first period class. It's a brand new classroom. As it turned out, the classroom was so new that it wasn't my first period classroom at all. In fact, I didn't even have the class on my schedule. You guys are not laughing as much as the crowd back then did, <laughs> but, but that's okay. But instead of just walking away and avoiding an embarrassing situation, I froze there right in the middle of the doorway. Now at this point, I still could have made it out of there okay, but no, being my nervous sixth grade self, I dropped everything to the ground and froze there on that spot. Wondering why in the world I had just done this, I finally got control of myself, picked up my notebooks, and ran out of there. Even though only a few, a few kids saw my mistake, I felt downright stupid. As I finished eighth grade now and look back, I know I've come a long way from there, and I think all of you have too. <laughs> Being part of the school in many ways, from the chess team to the basketball team, I can honestly say that I've gotten to know at least 90% of you. As for the other 10%, well, we've got four more years to get to know each other, and then I'm leaving. <laughs> but note, I did not meet those other 10%. <laughs> but seriously, the class of 2011 has gone through a lot in three years. With every passing year, we've changed our ways, for better or for worse, usually for better. For example, after my sixth grade year, I finally found out that RAM Awards just couldn't buy me happiness. These are these awards that they give you out and you just realize they're so worthless. They give them out for you whenever you do anything good, whenever you answer a question right, whenever you throw your gum in the trash can, it's ridiculous. Or if you just give the teachers things, you can give them tissues or cookies and they'll just give you these RAM Awards. <laughs> it's totally corrupt. <laughs> it's awful. It's an, and I just realized that. Uh, I finally found out that Ram Awards just couldn't buy me happiness, and that racing to be first place in the lunch line wouldn't get me any more friends. Now, I'll admit that when I first realized this, I was sad. But giving up these goals gave me a lot more free time, and I've discovered hobbies that are a bit more meaningful, to say the least. And I don't know about you, but I've definitely learned that what everyone seems to be doing isn't always for me. As we learn this, we consciously make the decision to do what's best for us, whether, it's, whether or not it's the cool thing to do. It may be academic, social, physical, or anywhere in between, but no matter what ambitions we decide to pursue, they have some big effects on us. And as we pursue these ambitions, we've all found our passions, our strengths, what we do really well, and what we love, and we have built on those skills. We found ourselves where we're at and chosen where we want to go. And through all of these choices, we have defined ourselves and grown into more mature people. Yes, even Malcolm. And that was, that was the edgiest line of the night, because Malcolm was the class clown. Jeff went to middle school with me. And uh, Jeff, yeah, there we go. <laughs> was Malcolm a clown, Jeff? Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I was jealous of your football skills in high school. Uh, but looking back at the year, it's easy to see that we're not quite grown-ups yet. Whether it's Ben Saunders giving Miss Doty a hug goodbye, or Miss Doty's this little old lady. She was just barely teaching still. That's great. <laughs> but she was so cute. A whether it's Ben Saunders giving Miss Doty a hug goodbye, or some of us rebelling against the dress code by wearing wacky shirts and our mom's jeans, we can be found quietly resisting adulthood on any given day in any classroom. But not all of our humor is so restrained and peaceful. From the daily lunchroom choir of Happy Birthday, they sang Happy Birthday to the same kid every day. <laughs> and, um, the teachers hated it and everybody else loved it. Um, hold on just a second. 
Okay. From the Daily Lunchroom Choir of Happy Birthday to a memorable communication arts class involving a fart machine and an oversized bottle of Pepto-Bismol, we really are still a bunch of quirky teenage kids. And we know you adults don't find some of what we do funny, but to us, it's just a little break from our everyday work. So thanks to all of you kids who make life, life interesting. Thanks to you teachers for making it meaningful, and thanks to you parents for keeping everything on track. Without all of you, school just wouldn't be the same. I would be just me, it would be just me, the janitors, and the lunch ladies. And I think that might be a little bit awkward. <laughs> Anyway, before I take up too much of our last time together, let me leave you with a, with a quote from John Dewey. When I first found it, I wasn't sure who John Dewey was, but after a little research, I found out that he went to school just like you and me. <laughs> Actually, his whole job was to think about school. He was an educational philosopher, so I figured he must be pretty smart when it comes to this stuff. In his words, Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. So congratulations for making it this far. And as you move one step closer to adulthood, I urge you to go out into the world as students forever, learning, living, and loving life to the fullest. Thank you. I love this exhibit. I think it's a great idea, and thanks for listening. Fantastic. Um, we have about, we have, uh, what, about a, four, blah, blah, blah. a little over 15 minutes left in this session. What's that? Unfortunately, you, you did your, your 20, but if you come back next time, please bring them next time. Um, sir, we, we have room on, this, on the schedule up to, up to 17 minutes. Would anybody like to sign up? Anyone, anyone. Yeah. 
speaker for Diction for Dollars, part one of this evening is Jeff Fox. Will everybody please welcome Mr. Jeff Fox. Okay, so last time I was here, I basically improvised a little speech about uh, this guy, Ray Kurzweil, and what he sort of meant to me. Uh, but now I actually just down I have his book, uh, but I, I'm lending it to a friend, so I just downloaded, I think illegally, a free uh, copy of it, and I'm just going to read some excerpts, uh, and hopefully he kind of presents the ideas in a better way than I could in my improvised speech, but I'll start with the introduction. Okay. At the age of five, I had no idea, I had the idea that I would become an inventor. I had the notion that inventions could change the world. When other kids were wondering aloud what they wanted to be, I already had the conceit that I knew what I was going to be. The rocket ship to the moon that I was then building, almost a decade before President Kennedy's challenge to the nation, did not work out. But at around the time I turned eight, my inventions became a little more realistic, such as a robotic theater with mechanical linkages that could move scenery and characters in and out of view, and virtual baseball games. Having fled the Holocaust, my parents, both artists, wanted a more worldly, less provincial, religious upbringing for me. My spiritual education, as a result, took place in a Unitarian church. We would spend six months studying one religion, going to its services, reading its books, having dialogues with its leaders, and then move on to the next. The theme was many paths to the truth. I noticed, of course, many parallels among the world's religious traditions, but even the inconsistencies were illuminating. It became clear to me that the basic truths were profound enough to to transcend apparent contradictions. At the age of eight, I discovered the Tom Swift Jr. series of books. The plots of all the 33 books, only nine of which had been published when I started to read them in 1956, were, all, were always the same. Tom would get himself into a terrible predicament in which his fate and that of his friends, and often the rest of the human race, hung in the balance. Tom would then retreat to his basement lab to think about how to solve the problem. This, then, was the dramatic tension in each book in the series. What ingenious idea would Tom and his friends come up with to save the day? The moral of these tales was simple. The right idea had the power to overcome a seemingly overwhelming challenge. To this day, I remain convinced of this basic philosophy. No matter what quandaries we face, business problems, health issues, relationship difficulties, as well as the great scientific, social, and cultural challenges of our time, there is an idea that can enable us to prevail. Furthermore, we can find that idea. And when we find it, we need to implement it. My life has been shaped by this imperative, the power of an idea. This is itself an idea. Around the same time that I was reading the Tom Swift Jr. series, I recall my grandfather, who had also fled Europe with my mother, coming back from his first return visit to Europe with two key memories. One was the gracious treatment he received from the Austrians and Germans, the same people who had forced him to flee in 1938. The other was a rare opportunity he had been given to touch with his own hands some original manuscripts of Leonardo da Vinci. Both recollections influenced me, but the latter one is, had returned to me many times. I've returned to many times. He described the experience with reverence, as if he had touched the work of God himself. This, then, was the religion that I was raised with, veneration for human creativity and the power of ideas. In 1960, at the age of 12, I discovered the computer and, become, and became fascinated with its ability to model and recreate the world. I hung around the surplus electronics stores on Canal Street in Manhattan, they're still there, and gathered parts to build my own computational devices. During the 1960s, I was as absorbed in the contemporary musical, cultural, and political movements as my peers, but I became equally engaged in a much more obscure trend, namely the remarkable sequence of machines that IBM proffered during the decade. That decade, proffered, proffered? Yeah. From their big 7000 series, 7070, 7074, blah, 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 to their small 1620, effectively the first mini computer. The machines were introduced at yearly intervals, and each one was less expensive and more powerful than the last, a phenomenon familiar today. I got access to an IBM 1620 and began to write programs for statistical analysis and subsequently for music composition. I still recall the time in 1968 when I was allowed into the secure cavernous chamber housing what was then the most powerful computer in New England, a top of the line IBM 360 model 91 with a remarkable one million bytes, was one megabyte of core memory, an impressive speed of one million instructions per second, and a rental cost of only $1,000 per hour. 
I had developed a computer program that matched high school students to colleges, and I watched in fascination as the front panel lights danced through a distinctive pattern as the machine processed each student's application. Even though I was quite familiar with every line of code, it nonetheless seemed as if the computer were deep in thought when the lights dimmed for several seconds at the start of each such cycle. Indeed, it could do flawlessly in 10 seconds what took us 10 hours to do manually with far less accuracy. As an inventor in the 1970s, I came to realize that my inventions needed to make sense in terms of enabling technologies and market forces uh, that would exist when the inventions were introduced, as that would be a very different one from the one in which they were conceived. I began to develop models of how distinct technologies, electronics, communications, computer processors, memory, magnetic storage, and others, developed and how these changes rippled through markets and ultimately our social institutions. I realized that most inventions fail, not because the R&D department can't get them to work, but because the timing is wrong. Inventing is a lot like surfing. You have to anticipate and catch the wave at just the right moment. My interest in technology trends and their implications took on a life of its own in the 1980s and I began to use my models to project and anticipate future technologies, innovations that would appear in 2000, 2010, 2020, and beyond. This enabled me to invent with the capabilities of the future by conceiving and designing inventions using these future capabilities. In the, late, in the mid to late 1980s, I wrote my first book, The Age of Intelligent Machines. It included extensive and reasonably accurate predictions for the 1990s and 2000s and ended with a specter of machine intelligence becoming indistinguishable from that of its human progenitors within the first half of the 21st century. It seemed like a poignant conclusion, and in any event, I personally found it difficult to look beyond so transforming an outcome. Over the last 20 years, I've come to appreciate an important meta idea, that the power of ideas to transform the world is itself accelerating. Although people readily agree with this observation when it is simply stated, Relatively few observers truly appreciate its profound implications. Within the next several decades, we will have the opportunity to apply ideas to conquer age-old problems and introduce, and introduce a few new problems along the way. Uh, during the 1990s, I gathered empirical data on the apparent acceleration of all information-related technologies and sought to refine the mathematical models underlying these observations. I developed the theory I call the law of accelerating returns, which explains why technology and evolutionary processes in general progress in an exponential fashion. In the age of spiritual machines, which I wrote in 1998, I sought to articulate the nature of human life as it would exist past the point when machine and human cognition blurred. Indeed, I've seen this epoch as an increasingly intimate collaboration between our biological heritage and a future that transcends biology. Since the publication of this book, uh, I've begun to reflect on the future of our civilization and its relationship to our place in the universe. Although it may seem difficult to envision the capabilities of a future civilization whose intelligence vastly outstrips our own, our ability to create models of reality in our mind enables us to articulate meaningful insights into the implications of this impending merger of our biological thinking with the non-biological intelligence we are creating. This, then, is the story I wish to tell in this book. The story is predicated on the idea that we have the ability to understand our own intelligence, to access our own source code, if you will, and then revise and expand it. Um, we're going to skip over a few parts. Uh, consider J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter stories. Uh, these tales may be imaginary, but they are not unreasonable visions of our world as it will exist only a few decades from now. Essentially, all of the Potter magic will be realized through the technologies I will explore in this book. Playing Quidditch and transforming people and objects into other forms will be feasible in full immersion virtual reality environments, as well as in real reality using nanoscale devices. More dubious is the time reversal although serious proposals have even been put forward for accomplishing something along these lines. Blah, 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 blah. Um, Muriel Rukesire says that the universe is made of stories, not of atoms. In chapter seven, I describe myself as a patternist, someone who describes patterns of information as the fundamental reality. For example, the particles composing my brain and body change within weeks, but there's a continuity to the patterns that these particles make. A story can be regarded as a meaningful pattern of information, so we can interpret his aphorism from this perspective. This book, then, is the story of the destiny of the human machine civilization, a destiny that we have come to refer to as the singularity. That's the intro. I'm going to talk five more minutes real quickly um, just about the impact. Uh, this is chapter six of the book. 
skipping a lot, um, but it's the impact of these things. He goes into crazy amounts of technical detail. If you're interested, you can download it for free. Uh, but um, I'm going to skip that, and I'll just read what he thinks this will turn us into. The future enters into us in order to transform itself in us long before it happens. That's a quote from Rainer Maria Rilke. One of the biggest flaws is that in the common conception of the future is that the future is something that happens to us, not something we create. Michael Anisimov. Playing God is actually the highest expression of human nature. The urge to improve ourselves, to master our environment, and to set our children on the best path possible have been the fundamental driving forces of all of human history. Without these urges to play God, the world as we know it wouldn't exist today. A few million humans would live in savannas and forests, eking out a hunter-gatherer existence without writing, without writing or history or mathematics or an appreciation of the intricacies of their own universe and their own inner workings. It's a quote from Ramez Nam. What will be the nature of human experience once non-biological intelligence predominates? What are the implications for the human machine civilization when strong AI and nanotechnology can create any product, any situation, any environment that we can imagine at all? I stress the role of imagination here because we will still be constrained in our creations to what we can imagine. But our tools for bringing imagination to life are growing exponentially more powerful. As the singularity approaches, we'll have to reconsider our ideas about the nature of human life and redesign our human institutions. We'll explore a few of those ideas in this chapter. For example, the intertwined revolutions of genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics, which the previous three chapters went over in too much detail, will transform our frail version 1.0 human bodies, that's us, into their far more durable and capable version 2.0 counterparts. Billions of nanobots will travel through the bloodstream in our bodies and brains. In our bodies, they will destroy pathogens, correct DNA errors, eliminate toxins, and perform many other tasks to enhance our physical well-being. As a result, we will be able to live indefinitely without aging. In our brains, the massively distributed nanobots will interact with our biological neurons. This will provide full immersion virtual reality incorporating all the senses, as well as neurological correlates of our emotions from within the ner nervous system. More important, this intimate connection between our biological thinking and the non-biological intelligence we are creating will profoundly expand human intelligence. Warfare will move toward nanobot-based weapons, as well as cyber weapons. Learning will first move online, but once our brains are online, we'll be able to download new knowledge and skills. The role of work will be to create knowledge of all kinds, from music and art to math and science. The role of play will be, well, to create knowledge, so there won't be a clear distinction between work and play. Intelligence on and around Earth will continue to expand exponentially until we reach the limits of matter and energy to support intelligent computation. As we approach this limit in our core of the galaxy, the intelligence of our civilization will expand outward into the rest of the universe quickly reaching the fastest speed possible. Uh, we understand that speed to be the speed of light, but there are suggestions that we may be able to circumvent this apparent limit. Um, and I'm, let me just end with a nice, let me give you some closure. Uh, okay. <coughs> I'm gonna race through this. Uh, A common view is that science has consistently been correcting our overly inflated view of our own significance. Stephen Jay Gould said, the most important scientific revolutions all include, as their, own common, as their only common feature, the dethronement of human arrogance from one pedestal after another of previous convictions about our centrality in the cosmos. But it turns out that we are central after all. Our ability to create models, virtual realities, in our brains, combined with our modest looking thumbs, has been sufficient to usher in another form of evolution technology. That development enabled the persistence of the accelerating pace that started with biological evolution. It will continue until the entire universe is at our fingertips. Thank you.
such perfectly timed readings tonight. So it's perfect tonight. So um, we're going to take a short break, and then we'll reconvene at a, a, a little uh, right around eight o'clock in here um, with Anna Mayer's uh, Word the Word negative sessions. Um, uh, if you have time, uh, make sure you grab, uh, if you're planning to stick around, grab one of the uh, publications. Uh, issue three is out, and then we also have from the previous two weeks as well. Um, and feel free to dig around. There's also beverages and food outside up front, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. So um, we'll be back at 8 o'clock with Anna, and then once she's done, we'll come back with uh, part two of tonight's Diction for Dollars. All right, thank you.